Amen. Well, welcome back, everybody. Those of you that have been following this teaching, and uh, I, in my heart, I pray that God would give you the spirit of revelation and and enlightenment in the words that have been spoken. Because when we talk about a lot of this teachings that I've been going through, that I'm certainly I'm aware of. Sometimes when things are spoken and if you're not got these eyes to see, ears to hear the prophetic, especially about the end times, it can be difficult to quickly understand what's being said unless the Spirit of God helps you. But that's my prayer for all of us. If we don't have the Spirit of Revelation, the Spirit of God on us, as we go through His Word, then none of us will know who we are, what we have, and what is God's intentions for us. But that's why it's important that I want to pray now that as I get started in this teaching, that the Lord would open up to all of us truths about what's in his heart and what he has done for us. So let me just pray. So Father, I just thank you that this day is a good day. It's a good day that you've given all of us. And I thank you, Lord, for your ongoing blessing and favor and that you would speak into us, unveil who you are, unveil what you said. And you've spoken to the writers, they faithfully wrote it down. And now as we read what is in your heart, that it's only you who is the author to unveil it to us. We humble our heart before you. We know we cannot discern anything in the spirit unless it's given to us by your spirit so today lord we humble our heart that we would see to believe and that we would submit to receive it so we thank you now for your word revealed to us in jesus name amen and amen well praise the lord i've been speaking and we've been talking about <clears throat> the straight gate the narrow way back in Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 and I've taken it as a subject because the times in which we are now living are at the end of the age it's the time of harvest and anything to do with the second coming and I'll use that word second coming uh, so that it puts you in at least an understanding of the position in which we're speaking but the second coming of Christ and everything to do with his second coming, right, is relegated to one major feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if you've been on this journey for a little while with me, you would clearly understand what I'm speaking about. But for those of you that are just tuning in, maybe for the first time or somebody's, uh, you know, flick this to you uh, on Facebook or YouTube, whatever, that we need to clearly understand that God has put things in its, di in its dimensions, or should I say its dispensations. And if I can put it to you like this, Jesus only died once on the cross. But the Spirit of God has taken that one death and what Jesus did, and he has administrated that three separate feasts so when he died once we see it then the benefits of it coming out through the feast of passover which means we got born again of the spirit of god and we thank the lord for that but the second administration of that one death of christ was that now we are baptized in the holy spirit speak in tongues we can you know see the gifts of the spirit operating in and through our lives and we are beneficiaries of that that's all very good in God but there's one last administration of his death this last dispensation is called the Feast of Tabernacles now the first two feasts Passover and Pentecost they have their order they have their place and their benefits and that's good in God but you see if I can put it like this the cloud has moved one more time and now we've come to the Feast of Tabernacles. My point is this. I want to make it as clear, as clear as I can. 
this is the feast, and it's the only feast that has been ordained of God to unveil and show and manifest the truth about his coming. The truth about, you might say, the second coming, or the manifestation of his presence in and through a people. All end time events, all end time signs that are inwardly, all has to do with the Feast of Tabernacles. So if ministries and yourself are still here in Pentecost, there's no problem with that. However, if you want to have the truth of understanding how his return is going to happen, then we've got to make a conscious decision to come across and be part of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now the Feast of Tabernacles is just mainly a heading, but it has three small feasts that are associated with that Feast of Tabernacles. The first is the Feast of Trumpets. Second is the Day of Atonement. And then the last is Feast of Tabernacles. And it's commonly said, Feast of Tabernacles proper. It means that the Tabernacles, this Tabernacle, my physical body, is going to change, right? And when we come into this Feast, the Feast of Trumpets is giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, to unveil prophetically the Day of Atonement. That's the day of His return. That's the day of Christ. The Day of Atonement is the day of Christ. It's the day of His return, the day of His visitation, right? Unto a perfect day. That's all speaking about this day that we're coming into. Now, when I speak about the Feast of Tabernacles, it might help you also to know that we're, we're referring to the day that Paul spoke about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right? And I'll give you the, 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 the correct scripture there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says it very clearly that we will be changed in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye. He says it in verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He goes on to say, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal, that's us, mortal, we're still alive, must put on immortality. For when this corrupt, corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought the past the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now that scripture, we all through in our church life have heard about that. Ever since I was small, I've heard about the coming of the Lord, that we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now as true as that statement is made, God also hasn't left us out in the coal so that we fumble our way along and just have a heart towards God that will one day he's going to snatch us, snatch us away or change us or do all this as long as our hearts are open to him. No, it's a bit more in this in that God has given us his word and he's given us his word precisely that the steps of a good man are ordered by God and there are steps in the spirit that we are to see and clearly walk through. And so it brings me back to this point that I said earlier that we are to go to the straight gate, go through the straight gate, the narrow way, which is a pathway. The scripture also says uh, earlier, it talks about the highway of holiness, right? And I'm just pointing out that, that truth there for this reason is that God is wanting us to go through so that we can know that there is a specific way back to the Father. We come from Him, we've had this massive fall out of and away from Him, right through Adam and Eve's sin. They not only fell from grace, they fell from sonship. But now through Christ, who is God's Son, has made a way for us back to the Father as a son, right? And there is so much to be said about this, but I'm only highlighting that because I want us to understand the context of the season that we're in, which is the end times. That's now. And the Feast of Tabernacles is now. Now, we are getting people saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, but we're moving them all into this season because it's vitally important for us to know this. So, 
in my heart as I was thinking this through and praying about this, the Lord spoke very clearly to me and said that the seven times that Jesus bled, which started off in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he bled all the way to the cross, are the seven places where he bled, it released a part of the covenant of God that speaks to us about the journey in which we are to take. So you might say the seven times where Jesus bled are the seven steps back into his presence. You could put it like that. Or the seven words of instruction, the seven counsels of God, right? The seven times that Jesus was, was bleeding was the seven times that we need to hear what the blood was saying when it was, when it was given, right? And so he bled, the Bible says, and he sweat great drops of blood. We talked about that. I don't need to talk about it again, but go back through, through the uh, series and you have a look and you'll see I try to articulate that the best I can and what happened there because the blood speaks. The second time was his back was ruptured with the stripes. There's a whole lot of truths around there. And if you get into that study, you'll find that the Spirit of God will talk to you a bit more about what was being said there. But the blood spoke there for our healing and our health. Now the third one is where we're up to, which is the crown of thorns that was pressed down on his head. And when that happened, Jesus bled and the blood spoke concerning that area of his body, which affects us. And of course we know that the next time was in the right hand and then in the left hand, then on his feet and the last time was on his side. We'll get to those teachings, but right now we've been on this journey about the crown of thorns that was pressed on the head of Jesus. And I want us to understand that when they were pressed on his head, he was able then to release a blessing that first broke the curse off us, all right? Because the carrier of the blood is the Holy Spirit, but the blood carries this expression of the intent of the heart of the Father in every area where he bled. So I took as a subject strongly because the Lord has been impressing it upon me. And I spoke about the crown of thorns because the thorns started back there in the Garden of uh, Eden where in Genesis chapter 3 it talks about about that area where he was you know where he took the thorns upon his head and God was able then to set us free by taking it upon his own head and for that we are you know we are thankful for that amen so the crown of thorns he broke the curse where was the thorns put it was put on his head there was a curse upon our head and the head is significant not only for the head of Christ but for us that we are to come into what the blessing is all about so when the crown of thorns and he paid the price he redeemed us he sanctified us he broke the curse off our mind because the mind is considered this place where God desires to be God desires to speak through so we can see the truth about the mind which is also talking about the mind of Christ and Jesus broke every curse off our mind that we might receive the mind of Christ and when I look at that that scripture in 1st Corinthians chapter 3 at the end of that chapter Paul says this very clearly he says that I might have that we have the mind of Christ that's what he says very clearly and so we've got to come to a place in ourselves that when we come to the Lord, that he will give us this great mind of Christ, which I, which I appreciate what God is doing through, through us. Amen. Sorry, that was in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. He says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have, Paul said this, but we have the mind of Christ. Now, Paul was speaking that prophetically. He was speaking that in faith. Now, Paul wanted that mind of Christ, and he spoke at that, I have the mind of Christ, which meant, we've got here a little drawing here, spirit, soul, and body, which meant that by faith, this mind of Christ sits in my spirit. It sits in your spirit, the mind of Christ. 
But there's coming this season that this character, the character of the mind of Christ, is going to be made central to our soul area where this man of sin is sitting. Right now, many of us are still thinking with the, with the mind of the man of sin. We're still thinking and seeing things through the beastly, the beastly nature, through the beastly eyes that begun in the garden. But here it is. I thank God for this. That because Jesus... Put the, allowed the crown of thorns to come on his head has redeemed our mind it has redeemed the character of our mind it's removed the beastly nature and now I have the mind of Christ and for this we can give God thanks for but our but problem is this and this is what we've been speaking about is that Jesus said if you don't go through the narrow way then there's, there's, there's just another way of going about it and that is you get caught in the broad way in the wide gate and the broad way he said that leads to destruction if you get trapped in the broad way then you're not going in the narrow way the straight gate which means you're left to all those sorts of things that are there in the broad way that will bring destruction to you I'm speaking to the church not once do we speak about the things that's out in the world or the people in the world what they should be concerned about is getting saved, coming into the first feast, Passover. Then we as ministries of the church need to move them from Passover to Pentecost, get them filled with the Holy Spirit, and then move them into tabernacles, also known as the kingdom of God. Now let me just highlight this. Why would I say that? Because Jesus said that. Unless you're born of water, Passover, and of the Spirit, Pentecost, you cannot enter and he uses this word, the kingdom of God. That's the tabernacles. And so what God is putting in us and in our spirit is that we need to be going down the straight gate during this season. And we've got to hurry to move in that because once that door is closed, it, shut, it shuts out those who, have, who haven't found that way. It shuts them out forever. It is a sad thing. Exciting for those that are going through the straight gate but very sad for those that won't find it. And I'm not saying that to condemn anybody. I'm saying what Jesus said, how it will be. He said there'll be few that find it, but the broad way, many will go thereat. Many will go that way. And here is this scripture in Revelation chapter 16 and verses 13, 14. Let me just read this because I want to focus a little bit on that and then move across to Revelations chapter 9. He says this, Revelation 16 verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils working miracles. We won't touch on that too much today. We'll get to that another time. It says here, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, right? To gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, going back there to verse 13, it says, out of the mouth of the dragon. Mouth meaning words. And it's words that have the character of the dragon. And I said last time, that the meaning of the word dragon is to devour. The dragon only has one real major plan. His priority is to devour the word of God, but more importantly, he's after the man child, which is a word that gives birth to a character of the father as a son, right? And so he's after the man child, man child child the greek word is hurios that word hurios means mature son right so it's not just a child baby it's a mature character and man child it means man is the second man so the first man was adam who fell but now when we were born of the spirit of god jesus became the first of this second race of man he was the second man Right, so we've got man child, which is the second man that's mature as a son. So the man child. Now there's more in that, but that's basically a snapshot of the character of that word man child. Okay? So the devil as a dragon, this word that comes up from him, he releases it. 
Where does it go? The Bible says that he releases it into the kings of the earth. Now, this is, this is his whole teaching. The kings of the earth, and it's a sad thing because it struck me so hard a few days ago, and, it, and I had to, actually I was driving and I had to pull across onto the side of the road and I was in absolute shock that the kings of the earth are ministries that are in the earth. They are Pentecostal ministries. They have to be Pentecostal ministries because there's just Passover and, and Pentecost and sometimes we relegate a lot of this stuff to the old traditional churches and the old traditional speakers. No, this is all those that are kings and influences in the church. I said before, they are not politicians. They are not presidents that govern the world or govern the earth. It's nothing to do with that. Everything has to do with what's in the spirit. And I want to tell you that kings of the earth are those ministries that are earthly. They're earthly. We'll talk about that in a minute. But these kings of the earth are kings of carnality. They're kings of the soul. Listen to what I'm saying now. Concerning the second coming. Their words about the second coming or the return of Christ. And just, just as a point of interest, you know the word in the Greek when it says second coming, you know the word second? The word second in the New Testament means the second half of the first. So the first was Jesus. He was the head. That was the first. Well, who's the second half? It's us. The manifestation of the sons. The second coming is the manifestation of the sons of God. So the second is the second part of our first manifestations as sons. Anyway, that's just a side teaching. But I want you to clearly understand how it, it impacted me when I saw that these three ungodly defiling words of deception, one came out of the dragon, which was to devour, that went into these ministries. These Pentecostal ministries that are around the earth that are speaking all sorts of things concerning his, his return. Speaking all sorts of things about end times. And it's coming out of their soul. And the reason I say that, if you stay in Pentecost, it matters not how prophetic you are in Pentecost and speaking those Pentecostal words, that's a blessing. But if you decide somehow in yourself to step over and start speaking about end time word and you haven't been baptized in the fire of, this, of, of the feast of trumpets which was given by God by the spirit of God for this express purpose to unveil the day of atonement which is the day of Christ the day of his return if you are not baptized in the fire of his word concerning trumpets that you have nothing to say, there's nothing you can interpret because it's a mystery and it's wrapped up in parables. The kingdom of God will be silent when it comes to you understanding what it has to say. It won't speak to you unless you are baptized in the Feast of Trumpets. That's the authority and the mandate that God has given to the church. Amen. To get that, you've got to make a decision to go across. And if you're not going across, According to the word and the authority of the word, you cannot hear the end time. So my prayer is this, is that I'm speaking stuff out of the spirit of God that somehow, and all you've got to do is humble your heart and ask the spirit of God to minister to you. Now, whether you are in ministry or you're just a member of the body of Christ, you're as important as anything to God, anything to God concerning this whole move of God. He wants you to come into your inheritance, to come back into your rightful position mm -hmm, as a son. And so we're on this journey. But I want to say that these kings of the earth, they are men who have great influence, who are earthly in their influence, and they are speaking into the church of Jesus Christ, and they are now committing this spiritual fornication and I'll, 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 I'll touch on this a little bit to, uh, later, but it's important that we know that they are in the earth. Now, just come with me over here. You'll see here that it says that the kings of the earth, at this time, I've given four characteristics of how they operate or how they think. One is they're against the work of the spirit. Secondly, they interpret end times out of their own soul. 
That's a major problem, right? Even if you interpret anything out of your soul, whether you're in Pentecost or Passover, you've got a problem. It's got to come from the Spirit. What do you mean by that, Pastor Brian? It's got to be initiated by the Holy Spirit. You've got to wait on him until he talks to you. You've got to read the word in anticipation that the Spirit of God of that word is going to breathe on that word so you can hear it. That's the whole purpose of it coming out of the Spirit. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you feel. And it doesn't matter how it seems to line up with circumstances that are out there. It has to start from the Spirit to your spirit. Mm -hmm. spirit to spirit and I have said this and I have labored this point that scripture must interpret scripture that's good hermeneutics right and we are approaching the word as they say a theological term allegorical studies which is what we're doing we're taking what is a, a parable that has a description in the natural like this here a natural description but we have it pushed up into the spirit and so we get the scriptural or the spiritual interpretation of it. All right? So if you are caught in this area and you just say anything, and what I've heard, and I don't chase it much, I don't look through the internet a lot, but what I've heard in my life over, my, over the years that I've heard, the stuff that we are being brought up on is nothing but chaff. It is a violation of interpreting the word and it's an abuse of the word because if ministers stand up and they ins and they speak on God's behalf and yet they are speaking out of their own soul that means that they are speaking and misrepresenting God through the through his word and God does not like being misrepresented and saying things that ministers say and God never said it you just got to go through Jeremiah 23 with one quote in his scripture in there. But if you read it, take time out to read it, you'll see that he's against those who prophesy. And he also says it very clearly that he's against those who steal their neighbor's word. Oh, maybe we need to go there because there's a lot of people in this end time move who are doing just that. They are stealing Stealing one another's word or their neighbor's word, as it says. It says in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse, and verse 30. It says, therefore, behold, I'm against the prophets, says the Lord, that steal my, my words, everyone from his neighbor. So, for me, going back to Revelation chapter 16, he said, I've seen three unclean spirits like frogs the character of the frog is that it leaps right so somebody has come up with certain doctrines concerning the end times out of their own soul they say something they even write a book and because people think if you write a book most times that it must be authentic no go back to the source of it where did it come out of don't believe anything until God talks to you even what I'm saying, go and check it out. I humble my heart to say to you, check out from the word yourself what is being spoken. What you hear, examine it with the word. Be like the Bereans in the book of Acts. Be like them. Because what they did, they heard the apostle Paul, heard the apostle Paul, but they didn't believe everything that he was saying. They went and checked out the word, what he was saying. That's what I'm asking you to do. Go and check the word. Do something that you haven't done for a long time. Sit down and study. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Be a workman, right? And study the word to know what God is saying. So here it says that these frogs, they leap, they leap out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. What am I trying to say? As they jump into some minister, he says it, and another minister picks it up, and then he repeats it without doing any personal study on it and suddenly you got the whole planet all croaking like frogs all saying stuff that is not from God but it's come out of the soul and I want to tell you there's no credibility in that there's no credibility in just repeating somebody because it sounds good listen if you've examined what somebody said and it is from the spirit of God it's okay to take a hold of that pray over it and and then partake of what's being said if it comes from the spirit because it'll touch your spirit but you've got to be aware of that mm -hmm. you've got to be aware so here this interpreting end times out of the soul is a major 
issue and a major problem in the church of Jesus Christ. It really is. And I'm just asking for ministers and people of God, especially ministers, if you feel that you're called to speak on the end times, right, then you really need to check it through with God yourself on what he is saying, right? Because it's not a Pentecostal move. You know, I heard that song, we need another Pentecost. We don't need another Pentecost. We need another feast. And the feast that we're after is the feast of tabernacles. That's what we need. And God is beginning to bring this feast of his word to us because in that word is transformation. In that word is your inheritance. In that word is an identification that was always in you but confirmed by the word in this hour that you are truly a son of the living God. And that's what the Lord wants to bring you into. So, having said that, many of them are ignorant of the season in which we live. People, a lot of ministries, Pentecostal to the back teeth, do not know that the Feast of Tabernacles has already begun. They don't have a clue about the end times. Or well, they might get an end time speaker in that'll say a few things about that, and that's about it. All they're interested, really, is trying to get fixed here and fixed there and get healed and done that. Listen, there's a bigger picture going on here. There's a massive important truth that's happening in the earth and we get caught up as ministries. We're doing a lot of things around the planet, a lot of things around our church and around the, around the nation. Stop. Just stop and look at what God is saying. Listen to what is happening. This is the hour and the season of his return. And there's a company of people that are hearing his voice in this hour, in this season, right? And I want to tell you, coming across, you've got to leave a lot of baggage behind. You've got to leave your, your ministerial titles back there because God wants to clothe you with something else. His word. You've got to leave your positions, your denominations, all your gifts that you are flowing in. They do work in that area. But over here, it's a different order. It's a different garment. It's a different language because it's going to bring a different truth to bring and change and transform you. That's what God wants to do. So the season is here for us, for what God wants us to do. However, the last one is what I'm laboring a little bit because it's in my heart to do this, or the Spirit of God has put it there, and that is the kings of the earth, ministries, Pentecostal, full-blown ministries that have not made the transition but believe they do. They believe they have the mandate from God to speak at that end times. And I want to tell you, if you haven't gone across consciously to know that you are part of the Feast of Trumpets or the Feast of Tabernacles, then you need to really sit down and ask the Holy Spirit to check what you're saying. Because if you don't, and you're speaking out of your soul, then you will commit spiritual fornication. You are impregnating his church with carnal words that are not from him, and the people are receiving it and being stimulated by it. And the scripture is very clear that it talks about the kings of the earth are committing spiritual fornication with the church. It says in Revelation chapter 17, it says, whom the kings of the earth, verse 2, have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been drunk or made drunk with the wine of her fornication. But it says the kings of the earth are committing this spiritual fornication. We got a problem here, people. It's a massive problem. And I, 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 try, I am trying in God to find the words to express, and only the Holy Spirit can do this, how serious it is to speak something into his church, his womb, something that is not from God. Jesus paid the price to cleanse his church, to clean his church. But we've got a bunch of ministries called the kings of the earth that are speaking nothing but carnality, soulish, and words from the dust that's impregnating this church of Jesus Christ. You have no business doing that. And if you want to hear from God, you need to get back and get on your heart before God and say, Lord, let me speak the word of the living God. Now, I, I'm, under same, I'm under the same judgment. If I don't speak what God is saying, then I'm in trouble. But you see, once, I, once you humble your heart before God and you know that the transition is there and he puts, that, he puts that confirmation within you, then you feel a liberty to speak that and you know that God is doing it. 
Let me say this. The difference between the kings of the earth and those that are speaking God's word, you'll find that the kings of the earth are caught by looking at the signs that are external. They're looking for the external signs that the wars speak of Russia and Iraq and, and uh, you know, Iran and, and Babylon and, and they'll, they'll talk about all of these things, right? And they're looking for earthly signs and trying to find scripture to confirm those earthly events and those earthly outward signs as being from the, from the Lord and for our, our day and our time. It's not true. It's not true. Outward signs, let me say this, versus inward discernment. Because inward discernment says this, I'm looking for the signs of his return in me. And that's what this word is about. It's about what's happening in me. All the wording and all the natural descriptions even of the book of Revelation refer either to the spirit and I refers to the man of sin in the core of your soul or the soul itself of course the physical body is going to be changed the temple of God the naos of God that is going to have an impact and God will change it but everything else is always external there's no circumstances outside that's written here for you to have a look at to get some sort of idea that he's coming Jesus said that to the Pharisees he said you know, you know the external times and signs when you see the, the sky is red and you know that the, but you are hypocrites because you can't even tell the signs of his coming which is inside. He said, I'll only give you the prophet of, of Jonah. We won't go there, but I'm just making this point that he's trying to put out there that it's not external, it's internal. Internal. Passover, you got born again inside. Pentecost, it happened to you inside. Guess what? Tabernacles is all about his return inside. Christ is already in you and he's going to manifest from you. That's what Romans chapter 8 speak about. The manifestation of the sons of God. Amen? So, as we come into this teaching, I, I, I want to stress that last time I spoke about the word of the dragon came out of him to devour. Now, just very briefly, I want to speak about the beast and the word that came out of the beast and it went into the kings of the earth. What then is the nature? <laughs> what then is the nature of the beast? Well, that's what we want to come to. Let's go to Revelation chapter 9 and I think I might be able to get through verse 1 and 2 this morning, all right? But if I can get through verse 1, uh, we're doing well. Right, because I want to slow this teaching down because I truly want to articulate this area here that the star fell from heaven to the earth and what does that mean mm -hmm. so we've got the natural description important to hear that a natural description but it's reflecting or it's imaging the things that happen in the spirit John was caught up in the spirit and he saw things in the spirit the Holy Spirit helped him to write it in such a way that he gave it, all right, natural descriptions of what he saw in the Spirit. So if I am to be clear on what the Spirit showed John, and John's trying to get that to us, I too have got to take this up to the Spirit. And how do I do that? Scripture interprets Scripture. That's it. Scripture interprets Scripture. Maybe one session I might take aside to teach about the principles of Bible interpretation. There are laws and principles that lock us into, and you can't go outside it, lock us into the laws of Bible interpretation, hermeneutics. We've got to know that the word is written in such a way that the word explains itself. All right? And when it explains itself, it's explaining about what's internal. It's personal, it's internal, and it's very intimate. Why intimate? Because you know he is speaking to you about stuff inside you, and no one else knows that because he's made it personal with you. Okay? So when we come into this area here, we've got to move this, this words of, that are natural up into the spirit by, by scripture. And so I've got written over here what this would mean and the scriptural interpretation of what he was talking about star the word fall the word heaven and to the earth 
So let's read the let's read verse one. That's Revelations chapter nine. And this is the fifth angel that sounded. It's the fifth trumpet. And when we say trumpet, that means prophetic. So John got up there and he heard this prophetic word that was to come in our day. He said, I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. That's what he said, first of all. And unto him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Interesting. Very interesting. I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Right? He saw it in the spirit prophetically. And now he's beginning to say, this is what I saw. Now, let me first take this word fall, because as I get the talk, we'll come back to the star. But the word fall, I've got written here, when you, you know, you get that strong concordance and you can read it up. The Greek number is 4098, right, in the Greek. So getting the interpretation of that gives me the, the understanding that the word fall means to come under judgment, all right? So when he fell, it wasn't, like he, he, it wasn't like he just fell somewhere, or he fell to the earth, but there was a reason behind the fall, right? And the spirit of that word or that meaning of fall was judgment. So he, he fell and fell under judgment, right? Fall means to descend from a higher place to a lower and by the way, that number there is, is not in the Strong's, but it's also under the fire definition. So the word fall means to descend from a higher, higher place to a lower, right? And can I just say this to you, that much of what we speak about is not only word, but it's character. So whoever is that star was in a high position and they fell to a lower position, which was the earth, and this word, when we get into it, it means earthy. So it, it talks about the character. He fell, this star fell inside himself. He fell from a high position of righteousness and he fell to the lowest place that you can be and that is through corruption. So he fell from righteousness to unrighteousness, from a high place of moral standard in God, of holiness, and he fell to unholiness. And that happened inside him, right? So he wasn't like a star that was external in the natural and suddenly he fell out of the sky and came down and whoosh, hit the earth like a falling star or a meteor that hits the earth. It's, that's external, external understanding. But the principle here is that he fell on the inside of himself. He had a position but fell. You know, for an example, you might say, the CEO done something bad on the business and the board got together and they said, you know, we're going to, have to put him back to a general manager. He's not the CEO because he'd done a few things wrong, so we've got to step him down. This was what happened. He was stepped down from a high position to a lower, but it all had to do with character. So here was this star that had the highest place and we'll see the highest place that he walked in, but he fell from there because he fell from a high place to a low place. He was judged. Now, where did he fall? It says that he fell to the earth. And I've cited a scripture here. I've got a few more that I'll let you know. But this word earth is earthy. Earthy means in the ground, in the dust. And it also speaks of carnality. But look, Jesus said in John 3, 31. Let's, let's have a look at that. John 3, 31. Jesus said, he that comes from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, right? And speaks of the earth, he that comes from heaven is above. So he's saying that if you are of the earth or of the soul, you are earthly. Maybe that should be earthly. I just put that in there. Earthly. L-Y. Earthly. Subject to the passions of the earth. Subject to all the feelings that's in the earth. Still speaking about us here. Internal. We are earthly. Another scripture, it says in 2 Corinthians 5. 
Let's have a look at that. Second Corinthians chapter 5. He says, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this is our earthly house, this physical body, Peter is saying, or, or Paul is saying, that's our earthly house. For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with, ha with hands, eternal in the heavens. So he's speaking about a glorified body, not the physical body that we are walking in. And he wants out of that, right? He wants to get out of that. But he's saying here, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed, a clothed upon with our house which is in heaven. He goes further on to say that he wants to be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now I, I'd like to preach more on that there, but my point is that he's just speaking about this earthly vessel that we're living in. Mm -hmm. Look what James says, the book of James. The book of James chapter 3 and verse 15. He says that this wisdom descends not from above. So he's talking about a whole range of things, those that lie against the truth. He said this wisdom doesn't send from above, from the spirit, from the third dimension, right? But it's earthly, it's sensual, and it's devilish. So anything that's regarded as being earthly, it's sensual and it's devilish. Well, the star that was up in the third heaven fell into this earthly area that became subject and limited to the soulish and the carnal realm, which means it's void of the prophetic understanding of that which is in the spirit because it's locked into itself in its own soul. It was in that position, but then it fell. But through Christ, he's lifted us, lifted us back up where we can see in the spirit. And that's where God wants to bring us into. Right now, we, are, we can see in the Spirit, but He's giving us eyes to see in the Spirit because the day is here that He's going to change the very core of our soul and wash our, our, our soul, our womb, and then our physical body will change. That's about to happen. So what's happening is that we fell, or someone fell, we'll find out who he is, but when he fell, he fell into the earth. But God, through Christ, is bringing us back up. In fact, even better than where that first star fell. He's given us something, a blessing. All right, so let me get on to this. So falling is to fall under judgment to the earth became earthly and he fell from heaven, right? For me, he fell from the third heaven. Let me put that here. He fell from the third heaven. Couldn't have been the second heaven because the second heaven is the soul realm. The second heaven is also the place where demons are. But let me just go with this scripture here, who the star is. Now let me first say that it cannot be Jesus because Jesus never fell. You might say, well, Pastor Brian, he was judged. Well, he was judged under, under other conditions. He never fell in his character. He was always righteous. He was always the righteous one. And he never sinned. All that happened to Jesus was that his body, he was judged in his flesh. He was judged for sin. He paid the penalty of our sin. And he came under judgment for us. But at not one point was he fallen from a holy position to an unholy position. He was never at all infected with sin. Not at all. And I know a lot of people quote that scripture in, in Corinthians where it talks about, and you don't need to, or you can go and check it up yourself, but it talks about he who knew no sin became sin. That's what it says. But you see, it doesn't say became sin. It means he became a sin offering. That's the Hebrew and Greek context of that verse, right? He became a sin offering. But here he's saying, I'm saying very clearly that it, it wasn't Jesus because Jesus came down to earth of his own free will, right? He, he, he just descended. He descended from the spirit. The word became flesh and dwell among us. He descended willingly. He wasn't judged and he, did, and he wasn't cast out. He didn't fall because of unrighteous acts. Not at all. Can't be Jesus. Number two, it cannot be the church. We're talking about the star. 
It's not Jesus that fell. And it certainly is not the church. Why do you say that, Pastor Brian? Why can't it be the church? Well, the church is not a single entity that's referred to as a star. It's not referred to as an angel, right? Which is what the word star means, an angel. Now, the church has a lot of angels like messengers. The church is the body of Christ and the church has a lot of angels. But it's not seen in scripture as a single star, a single entity in that sense, right? It's made up of many members. Or the church, the woman, has never ascended to that position to fall. She has never ascended there to fall down. And the truth is, Revelation chapter 12 shows her that when she got into that position as a bride, right, when she ascended as, into that position as a bride, she never ever falls from that position. So she was never there to fall, but when she gets into that position, guess what? She never falls. She doesn't fall at all. So my point here is that it's not Jesus, nor is it speaking and referring to the church. All right? And there's more things we can say around that, but I'm hoping that what I've said just then would help you understand that it's not the church. Number three, it's not an angel of God. Right? Because there is no scriptural account of one of God's holy angel ever falling. Right? So it's not an angel of God that fell. Right? Now you might cite and say, oh, but Pastor Brian, you know, in, in, in the book of Peter, it talks about all these angels that are falling down and they've all gone into darkness and they're in chains. Right? You might get, get that scripture and talk about it. Right? But you see, it's talking about a lot of angels. Here, this is talking about a star, one entity. And that entity is not Jesus, it's not the church, and it's not a holy angel of God that fell, right? So number four, this is where we get, it gets interesting. It's not the devil, right? Because the devil was never in the third heaven. He was never in the third heaven to fall. Can I say this? And I'll, this is where I want to go with this morning. And I want to spend some time around this a little bit this morning to let us know clearly what the word says, right? Satan was not in heaven. And he wasn't conducting the choir in heaven, right? He was always a murderer from the beginning. And he's the father of lies. That's what Jesus said. In the beginning, he was a murderer. That means he had no, he had no past before that, right? It, it, he, was, he was, as he was, he was a murderer from the beginning. And he was the father, which means he was the initiator of lies because he was the father of it. So there was, he was made with this character and he was trapped in his own character. At no stage, he was in heaven that he fell, right? And I pointed that out before with the dragon that with his tail, you know, drew a third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. We explained that. If you haven't caught that tape, it's the one before this one. Have a look at it because I explained that the devil, right, was never up in heaven. Three heavens. There's the third heaven, the second heaven, and the first heaven right? The first heaven is the natural skies, the clouds, the moon, the sun. That's the first heaven, that's the natural. The second is the solitial soul, the solitial realm. And that's where the demonic are camped in that area, right? In the, in the second heaven. The third heaven is where God is. No demon will ever enter into the third heaven. And if they come before him and the devil comes before God, he's coming in front of him in the second dimension and he has to speak to God who's in the third. Now God the Father in the third can come to the second and come to the first. He done it in Christ. So we, we need to understand that the devil has a limitation. He can only get up into the second, that's where he is. He can affect the first, but he cannot go into the third. Paul said, I was caught up in the spirit to the third heaven. So we know there's a third heaven. And that's where God is. Right? This star fell from that position. It wasn't Satan. So it couldn't have been the devil. He wasn't in the third heaven to fall. Jesus said that. You are your father, the devil. That's John 8.44, by the way. John 8.44. 
And the scripture, that's in Luke 10 verse 18, is referring to Revelation 12, 10. Luke 10, 18 says, Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's the second heaven that he fell from, not the third. And where did he fall? Where is it recorded in scripture where he fell? Well, it's in Revelation chapter 12, 10. He said, I saw him, I saw Satan was cast down. He was cast down from that position in the soul realm where he occupied where Adam should have been or Adam was. He removed him and he took that position, but now he was cast down in Revelation chapter 12. The accuser of the brethren has been cast down. Amen. That's what Luke 10, 18 is referring to. It's not referring to nine, uh, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. So it's nothing to do with the devil as we see it. I tell you who the star is. He's in this area here. Isaiah 14 and 12. The star that fell is Adam. It's Adam. Adam fell from his position. Adam was judged according to his character because iniquity was found in him. This is Adam. Let's go and have a look at this in Isaiah chapter 14. And let's see what the word says. Not my opinion, it's what the word says. And there's many, there are many in the church that understand what, I'm, what I am going to say, but there are millions that don't. There are millions that don't. When I get teaching this, I'd like you to go to your pastor and I want you to show that pastor and, and help and get him to help you understand what I'm saying or it may be something that he needs to look at so that we can all get on the same page about what the word says. Isaiah 14 verse 12 says this, How art thou fallen? Same word. How art thou fallen from heaven? That's the third heaven. O Lucifer. Mm, Lucifer. Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, you said in, in, the, in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Precious Lord, the sides of the north. This is not Satan. And I'll tell you why. It goes on to say in verse 14, And I will ascend above the heights of the cloud, I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. This is what the word says. But look at verse 13, still talking about Lucifer. He says, They that see you shall narrowly look upon you and consider you and say, Is this the man? Lucifer is a man. That's what it just says in the context of this verse. Have a look at your Bible. Have a look at all the Bibles, all the translation. It doesn't change. Lucifer is a man. What man? Adam is this man. He was the one, the Bible says there, that wanted to exalt himself. Where did he get that idea? Where was iniquity found in his heart? We'll go to Ezekiel 28 in a minute. But he says that this, this character trait, to exalt himself came from the devil himself. The devil spoke it into Adam and Eve. He said, you shall be as gods. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, uh, teaches that out. Where the man of sin sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. That's what it says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. It says that. But we've got to understand that God is trying to bring order back into the church you read that and ask the Holy Spirit to refresh you on this whole area I encourage you go to your pastor and ask them to say who is Lucifer and Lucifer in, in the mind of most people is Satan but it's not you know that Satan's not a man if Satan was a man somebody would have found him by now and got into him Somebody would have touched him up a little bit if, they, if he was a man, if he was physical. But he's not. He's in the spirit. That's not to say he's untouchable either. <laughs> there are those that still make a mark on him. But the point is this. Lucifer, right, is a man. Now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, And by the way, I know that in the context back there in Isaiah 14, 
uh, it was referring to the king of Babylon, right? But this is in the spirit. So we're going to push all of this, even the king of Babylon, all of the stuff, we've got to push it up. King of Babylon is still talking about the kings of the earth. So you've got to push it up into the spirit, right? And so Lucifer is a man. And that man was Adam. But look what it says here in Ezekiel 28. And the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thy heart is lifted up. And there I said, I am a God. It's the same entity. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. That's what I mean, among the people. And then the Lord says to him, Yet thou art a man. And you're not a God. Though thou set thy heart as the heart of God. Behold, he says, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that, that they can hide from you. He said, with thy, with thy wisdom and with thy understanding, thou hast gotten thee great riches and gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. He says, but this great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches. Thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, right? Because thou hast set thy heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers unto thee. And he talks about all those things that he's going to do. But verse 9 is what I want to get to. He says, Wilt thou yet say before him that slays me, I am God? But thou shalt, and thou art a man, and no God. You're not a God. He says, you're a man. He's still talking about Lucifer. Lucifer, the man. And you're not a God in the hand of him that slayed thee. Now verse 13 says, listen to this. He says, thou hast been, you were in Eden in the garden of God. That's Adam. Now we know that Satan was there in the garden as well, but you can't say Satan is Lucifer because Lucifer is a man. Whoa. Thou hast been in the Eden in the garden of God. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. This is Lucifer, the anointed cherub. Verse 15 says, Until iniquity was found in, in you. When did that happen? When did iniquity come to him? I just mentioned it. Genesis chapter 3. Thou shalt be gods. That's what came from the devil. Thou shalt be a god or gods. That's where iniquity started. And he and he received that. He believed and he received. And when that happened, right, he took that on. And the very nature of that word in itself started to self-exalt Adam himself. And we have the record of what happened after he ate that fruit. What was the fruit? It was words. What words? Words that came from Satan, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's where the pride and the high-mindedness came and the soul lifted itself up and it became the high places of the carnal thinking the high places of the carnal mind which is the seat of satan according to revelations chapter 2 it's the seat of satan it's the place where he wants to speak out of he put his character in there and therefore he wants to speak out of there but it says that here he was the anointed cherub verse 14 and then it goes down to verse 16. It says, O covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. So now we can get what God is trying to say through his word. We're starting to see that the federal head, Adam, the gatekeeper, the arbitrator, had lost his position and his relationship with God in the heavenlies. And he fell into the lower nature of carnality. He fell inwardly. He fell into himself. It was a character flaw. He went from righteousness to unrighteousness. Inside. His feet never went anywhere. He wasn't thrown into anything else. It went inside. He fell inside himself. And that, that vast void that he fell into, this power that he fell into, is also known as the bottomless pit, the abyss. But hey, I want to take that as a subject another day. I just want to major this point here this morning because we need to see the truth of his word. So, so let me just write this up here so that we can see it, if I can do it as, as like an equation, that Lucifer, Lucifer is a man, right? 
And we can also say that the man is also the covering cherub and the anointed cherub. Well, I'll just put AC, anointed cherub and the covering cherub, right? So that makes Lucifer, who is the man, he's also the covering cherub and he's also the anointed cherub, Lucifer, right? That's the equation we can look at. So the man, so the man, right, that is all these areas, the man is Adam. Lucifer is a man. The man is the covering cherub and the anointed cherub. Lucifer is also the covering cherub, the anointed cherub. Lucifer is, right, he up the man. Lucifer is the man. So the man is Adam. You got that? So Adam is Lucifer. Adam is Lucifer. What do you mean Lucifer? Lucifer is Adam's name. Adam is the species. Adam means the human. The human. Adam is the species, but Lucifer is his name. Adam's name is Lucifer. Whoa. Adam is the species, but Lucifer is Adam's name. If you do it this way, just to work it out, it helps you understand the truth of his word. So who fell on that day? It was Adam that fell. Lucifer fell. He was the son of the morning. He was the one that walked among the stones of God. It was Adam. The devil never did. He was never in that third heaven. He was not walking. He wasn't the choir, the choir bloke, you know, leading the choir. That was Adam. In him was the tablets and the pipes to worship God. Adam, Adam was an incredible being that was created in God's image. I want to talk about Adam in another session because we need to know and value the, the blessing and the, the, the creativity of God when he created Adam. He created him as a, an incredible specimen. Today, we don't have any idea really how beautiful he was and the power that was in him and how he operated in that power to even manage and keep the garden that had four major rivers flowing into it. He was the gardener. He had to keep those rivers. How could one man be commissioned to keep it all together by himself? And yet he did. Well, what power did he have that God gave him that sanctioned him to do all of that? He must have been a mighty man. A man. Yes, he was before sin hit him. And when sin hit him, he lost the ability to move the way he was under God. And he fell down inside himself. We'll talk about that. But here we are. We'll talk about that another time. But here we are in Revelations 19. I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. Adam came under judgment from the spirit world and he fell into the earth zone. He fell into the solicial and the soulish and the carnal. That's what the Bible says. And it says, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Well, to him. To who? To the fallen character. To the Adamic fallen nature. The beastly character. It was given the key. What key, Pastor Brian? The permission. That's the key. God gave him permission to open up. God gave him permission for this bottomless pit of its character and its, its, all its words of the beast is inside. God gave permission for it to be opened without restraint. And that's what I want to talk about next time. And I'm hoping to get through where it talks about the locusts coming out We'll speak about the smoke and the smoke that darkened the sun and the air. What does that mean? It's all typology. It's all metaphors, but it says something very important about those who are kings of the earth that would, would be trapped with this and who are then caught to open and speak out of their, out of their own soul. Right? It'll darken the sun and the air. And because of that, the locusts will come who have the sting of scorpions. And there's a range of other things. What's the locust that's coming out, Pastor? They're words. Words. 
And those natural descriptions of the locust and the scorpion and the battlements and all that stuff there is talking about the character of the words that are spoken out of the kings of the earth to try and battle against this word in the great day of God Almighty, Armageddon. I, I am shocked to even think that the battle of Armageddon is headed up by the kings of the earth, the Pentecostal preachers that know nothing about what they're saying. And it's dangerous to step over into a feast that you are not to go across, not to speak about it, if you haven't been baptized in this fire. And if you haven't come through the fire of the Feast of Trumpets, then you need to. And if you don't, you have no business speaking about this word. You need to humble your heart and get right with God. I say that with compassion in my heart. Otherwise, you'll find yourself as a king of the earth, trapped in this scripture of Revelations 9. You will be part of the fifth and sixth trumpet that releases this word of, of the beast and all its language against, against this word of the, of the man-child. You may not see yourself in that area at all. None of us see ourselves in that. We've done well in God. We've prophesied in God. We've done many things in God. How could you say that, Pastor Brian? I didn't say it. The Word says it. The Word says it. The Word says that in that day, they'll come to me and they'll say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Lord is Passover. Second Lord is Pentecost. These ministries only know God as Lord of Passover and Lord of Pentecost. That's why they say, they use it as, a, as, as an accreditation. They say, you know, we have prophesied in your name. We've even cast out devils. The Lord would say to them, because they never come across, he said, I've never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. You're saying things that I've never told you to say, and you believe that you were saying it in my name, and you believe that you were doing me a favor. But I want to tell you, I never knew you. I never intimately impregnated you with this man-child word. Therefore, you are cast into outer darkness. That means you are removed from his glory. With all your anointing, you are removed from the glory. That's what we're going into, his glory. Thank God for Passover and Pentecost anointing, but we're coming into the glory. There's a change and there's a specific purpose about this. And God is bringing us into that. So unless you know what you're speaking about, it's best that you say nothing and humble your heart to hear what the Spirit of God is saying in this hour. Otherwise, you'll find yourself in this position of Revelations 9, you'll be part of the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet and your, your being will be opened up, the soul will be opened up and out of your mouth will come words of a locust that would do nothing but destroy this word of God. In fact, it doesn't destroy the word, it destroys yourself. Because the words of the scorpion has a tail and it stings you. The tail, Isaiah chapter 9, says that the tail is the prophetic lies and it will sting you. I'll talk about that on our next, next session. But it's my plea to you that to him was given the key. To him is the Adamic fallen nature on the inside of the soul was given permission to now speak out of the bottomless, the bottomless pit the words that will be spoken in carnal and soulish ways. Well, as you can see, I'm a bit fired up. And for a lot of people, sometimes this type of ministry, this type of word, it's difficult to relate or hold on to, but it's your inheritance. You have the ability within you, if you humble your heart to God and say, Father, I desire to hear what's been spoken because that's the truth of his word. He wants you to understand. I've said this again and again as I've gone up to Papua New Guinea who do not have computers. They have some of the Bible, but they hear the word and they go to God and they sacrifice a lot to hear his word. Guess what? All the way in Western Province and parts of Port Moresby, they are beginning to relish and hear and understand this word and beginning to speak this word and they're finding their place before God in this word so I want, to, I want you to say I want to say this it's not so much the facilities and the faculties that we have here in the western world that we all need no the greatest thing that you could ever give to God is your heart humble your heart and let the spirit of God speak to you about your inheritance as a son 
I declare that, I pray that in Jesus' name. Until next time, God bless you, and I'll see you when we start to teach about the rest of this word. Amen. Darkness is fading away.